Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. So let's hop in our mental time machine and go back to last week where we streaked things from our environment and put those things on to nutrient auger plates. Remember these? Great. So we can see on the plates where they used to be just a clear medium. Now there are dots on them. What are these dots? Bacteria. bacteria. Yeah, these plates are formulated to be conducive to the growth of bacteria. So we've gone out in the environment, picked up single cells, put them on plate, and now these cells have divided through mitosis so much that we can see them. So this stuff is around us everywhere, and we've just promoted the growth enough to the point that there are now millions and billions of cells in every one of these dots. Now, zooming out a bit, what is bacteria? What is it compared to, say, us? What are some similarities? What are some differences? Just shout them out. They have DNA. They definitely have DNA. Um, all life of, as we know it on planet Earth uh, uses DNA as its genome. Um, some viruses don't, but it's debatable whether you call them alive or not. So yeah, bacteria definitely use DNA as their genome, just like we do. What else? Yep, yes I do. Just like plants, except the cell walls are made up of something slightly different, but they all have rigid cell walls. Um, Let's keep thinking about the DNA. How do they handle that DNA? Is there something that's different in bacteria than in people in the handling of that genetic information? Yeah. So what's uh, the term that we use for loose DNA in a cell? Yeah. Uh, so prokaryotes are cells that don't have a nuclear membrane. And eukaryotes are cells that do. So we're all eukaryotes. Our DNA is sequestered from the rest of the cellular environment in a nuclear membrane. And bacteria, that membrane doesn't exist. So that DNA is kind of washing around in the cytoplasm with all the other cellular components, which both has advantages and disadvantages that you'll talk about in class. Um, who do you think is, oh, let's call them the winner of planet Earth. We look around and we see a lot of people. Um, we don't see a lot of bacteria. So it's easy for us to think, you know, with all our technology and sophistication, that we're doing pretty good. And we are. There's about, I don't know, 7.3 billion of us on the planet. How many bacteria do you think there are? How many bacterial species do you think there are? Way more, way, way more. So there's somewhere between, oh, 10 million and a few billion bacterial species, different species of bacteria. So in terms of genetic diversity, they're way above us. You know, there's one, one homo sapien, billions of species of bacteria potentially. How about in terms of biomass? So people, um, homo sapiens, we occupy about 100 million tons on the planet. If you were to take all of our bodies, dehydrate all the water out of them, and weigh them, they would weigh about 100 million tons, 7.3 billion people. How about if you took all the bacteria, all the prokaryotes on the planet, dehydrated them, and weighed them? How much would they all weigh? No reason you should know this. It would weigh, some estimates go from about 350,000 to 550,000 million tons. 
<laughs> they dwarf us completely. So this is a very relevant part of biology. A lot of biology focuses on people because we have a vested interest in understanding human biology. But if you're trying to understand the biology of the Earth, our co-econauts, if you will, our uh, fellow organisms on the planet, it is incredibly relevant to understand these guys. So last class, we also mentioned a couple other interesting statistics about bacteria that if you were to take all of the cells that have what we typically consider your genome, the 46 chromosomes that make up you, so all those cells, and put them in a pile here and count them, and we took all of the cells on and in you that don't have that genome and put them in a pile next to it, that pile of cells would outnumber you 10 to 1. You are 10 times more prokaryote than you are eukaryote. And if you removed all those bacteria, you would die. They are absolutely essential to your survival. If you took all the genes in those prokaryotes and compared them to all your genes, they would outnumber you 100 to 1. So there's 100 times more genes that are not you in you than are you. So again, very, very relevant to our health even because these play a major role in helping us fight off invasive pathogens and keeping us healthy and helping us derive vitamins from our environment, like mineral K. We're almost completely dependent on bacteria in our gut, what's called our endofauna, I'm sorry, endoflora, uh, for deriving vitamin K. So what we're going to look at today is a gram stain. This was one of the first stains ever invented when people started to understand cell theory, understand germ theory, and try to understand the 450,000 million tons of bacteria on the planet. Um, the stain is what's called differential, meaning that it produces two outcomes that help us differentiate between classes and species of bacteria. It works by acting on a different morphology of bacterial species. So we'll look at that in just a second, but that's the overall gist of a gram stain, is it helps us differentiate between species of bacteria. So going back to the plates from last week, um, we used what we call a four-way streak. So we took our swab and tested a piece of the environment and then put that swab pretty densely on one part of the plate. The point there was to get as much bacteria from that swab on the plate as possible, make sure that we picked up something. We then took a loop, flamed it to make sure it was sterile, and dragged that loop through our first streak. The idea here was that we pick up some bacteria from that streak and move it over to this side of the plate. Flame the loop again, drag it through again, flame the loop one more time, and drag it through. So this is our four-way streak. What was the purpose of doing that? Why not just take our swab and cover the whole plate with it? The idea is that if we simply covered the whole plate, we might get a carpet of bacteria, just a undifferentiable carpet of many species, of many genomes. They'd all just be a mix. In doing this, the idea is that we take a dense layer and we dilute it down. Each time we move the sterilized loop through our previous streak, we're grabbing some cells and moving them to a different part of the plate. The point of this, and if done correctly, you should get single colonies. 
meaning that at some point, one cell was separated from all the other cells, landed somewhere on the plate, and that one cell grew a genetically homogenous colony. So every cell in that colony should be identical because they're all the descendants of one. That lets us actually analyze the species because we're only looking at the descendants of one cell. So they should all act the same. Whereas if you know we did gram stain on uh, a community of bacteria, we could get lots of species and lots of different results and it'd be hard to analyze what species are there. This is a way of getting one cell. So if you look at the plate I'm holding up here, and I don't know how well you'll be able to see that, but it's easy to see that there are at least two species on this plate because there are colonies that are kind of a dark yellow and colonies that are a dark white. And we can, with our toothpick, decide which one we look at, which gives us that additional control. So that's the point of the four-way streak. What we're going to do today is take a slide. They're in these top drawers. And a loop. With the loop, use your spray bottle. To get a little droplet of water on the tip. You see how that's clinging on there? And that's the amount of water you want on your slide. It's just a tiny drop. If you do too much, it'll take forever to dry. You then take a toothpick and pick a colony that you want to look at, that you want to apply the gram stain to from your Petri dish. And you just want only one colony. You want a single cell isolate of your uh, dish. And you put that on in the water drop and smear it around. So you're diluting the bacteria more. Are we using a toothpick for that? We're using a toothpick. Okay. I was. So you smear it around. <laughs> You then let this dry. Just air dry it for a while. You can put it in the fume hoods. That'll make it go a bit faster. Uh, and when it's totally dry, you flame it with a Bunsen burner. You don't fry it. You just kind of pass it close to the frame. And that fixes the bacterial cells to the glass so that they can withstand the staining process that I'm going to talk about. So you have one species on your slide. If you flip, oh, before that, I'll just mention that take a look at your plate and just look at the colony morphology. This is from Prokaryotes 1. What page is that? That is page 140. 140. And that uh, just helps you describe the macroscopic features of your colony, which are also indicative of, of species and they help you refine it. But just take a look at your colony. What's it look like? Is it shiny? Is it matte? Uh, is it raised, convex? Uh, concave, they're all there. Um, so just take a macroscopic look at 